following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. Subgraph development is, it really gives you a lot of time to, to work on being creative, which you would normally put into struggling to get your, your back end deployed. So it's an amazing set of tools. It's an amazing protocol, which really is creating quite a vast economy. I'd like to see it grow. I'd like to see more indexes and more delegators and more curators and more people using the decentralized network. high-level Web3 development talent to share ideas, problems, and opportunities, and to support each other and help leapfrog the African continent forward. The name Grafrica is a combination of the Graf and Africa, and is also the leading community for the Graf in Africa. As you're about to hear, Kent is incredibly passionate about Web3, the Graf, and the future of the people of Africa. Kent has a technical background coupled with a unique ability to explain complex topics and ideas. During our conversation, Kent shares many ideas from finding his way into Web3, his optimism for Africa and its people, and some fun exploration of the concepts of mining, subgraphs, graph grants, Web3, and the future of the graph. We began the conversation by talking about Kent's background and some questions related to where he lives in South Africa. My educational background is not as exciting as my professional background. I started learning at Richard School when I was younger. I started coding there. I'm just about it like JavaScript, Java, SQL, HTML, and C++. And after that, I briefly attended UCT, uh, University of Cape Town, to study psychology and sociology as my majors. But I enjoyed my minors a little bit more. But I couldn't pursue that course anymore because I had a little bit of financial constraints. So. Um, after dropping out at the end of the year, my father endeavored me to enroll at uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, which is a technical college, which is actually, weirdly enough, much better for learning computer programming if you have the right syllabus, because you have a lot more practical experience as opposed to someone, someone doing like a comp sci degree. Um, you usually have very little uh, experience doing practical work in, in a comp sci or a, a, a usual like standard um, traditional university degree in, in computer science, at least at least here in South Africa during my time of studying. And during that time, I learned quite a lot. Um, it was a great course. Um, I enjoyed studying there for the first year. Um, we learned a lot of really, really good things in the first year, like binary, C, SQL, um, a lot of the design principles. And um, it, it had a lot of different courses. And eventually, you could basically split into different tracks. Um, you could split into technical programming, you could split into like networking, which is Cisco systems, or more of the business side. I, at the end of my first year, um, I got hired as a full-time developer. So I transitioned into, into part-time studies. So going in at night classes from about 5.30 till 9. And that first job really was like throw, being thrown in the deep end. It was my first experience with C-sharp and stack.net systems and also some PHP and some other things, but I really got to learn a lot, a lot about how to work in large enterprise systems and large enterprise companies with dev teams that are kind of scattered all over the country or all over the world. And also all the other things that you don't really learn in university, like, you know, Redgate and Bluegate. And those are kind of tools to migrate SQL data across from, from one live database to another. And, um, Learned a lot of things not to do, learned a lot of things to do. Um, and after that, spent about six years um, after dropping out because um, I kind of just was really not happy with how CPUT was going with my, with my course because they weren't really teaching us many relevant things um, to do with development at the time. Um, they were teaching us really, really old standards um, and principles, and it wasn't really 
um, relevant to the current market or the, the current industry. So I basically I decided not to continue with that uh, because I was learning more in the in the working environment. Um, I was learning more on the job, and I was already about two to three two years experience working before I had uh, dropped out. I think I did three years there. Um, and then I dropped out and just went full on into software development. From there, I went to a couple large enterprise companies after that um, or worked on their systems. Uh, I worked for Dot Digital and Trimble and some other applications inside of the medical space um, and also the trucking logistics space with fuel. I learned a lot of great skills there. I learned a lot about agile at those companies and um, how to do things on scale, how to implement good standards and um, how to work as teams, you know, how to, how to manage teams and processes. And while I was there, I kind of Web3 bug bit me and I decided that it would be a good time for me to challenge myself and step up and try my hand at leadership. So I moved to a local and international uh, Web3 company. Um, it was a development house and Grew the development team there, set a lot of processes and standards in place and hired and trained some of the developers and learned from them as well. And that was kind of my baptism into, into the actually coding in the Web3 space. Um, on a side note as well, I ran a recording studio and a record label and a modular synthesizer retail store for a few years while doing that as well. I was quite ambitious and it was quite a lot of fun. It was a big community project. We released the One Vinyl, which is a collection of South African techno. and we were able to make a space for the community to have access to equipment which they would normally not have uh, for free. And we hosted a lot of jam sessions. We had some live streams from there. And it was a great space. Um, a lot of pretty cool artists came through and, and used it. And um, midway through last year, I, um, I stepped away from that company and I have basically been working as a freelancer and working with the Graph Protocol. Um, I'm one of the founders of Graphica, which is the home of the Graph in Africa, and we're a growing Web3 hub of African tech talent. And yeah, I work on various sort of jobs in the Web3 space. So whenever I meet with a guest of the podcast in a different part of the world, I always like to ask them about the local people's attitudes and opinions towards crypto. You're not the first guest to join me from South Africa, but I'd still like to ask you, how would you describe the people of South Africa's opinions and attitude towards crypto and Web3? In South Africa, it's actually quite developed. I was hearing about it back in 2011 and people were mining here and uh, mining Bitcoin. And when Ethereum came around, it was, you know, there were meetups. We had a couple of hackathons here, but the actual, the actual scene currently is quite big. Um, there's quite a large uh, amount of development companies, a lot of people interested in it. Quite a lot of thought leaders come from Cape Town um, or from South Africa, like Simon de Rivier and, and Andre Cornier. And there's, there's quite a few other people in the space that really have uh, really have changed it uh, globally and locally. Um, I won't name them, uh, but there's, there's quite a few. There's quite a few large names and quite a few names that you wouldn't know that have changed and, and basically were thought leaders in the space in a lot of different aspects of Web3 and blockchain. But I think that, you know, the, the, the South African mentality, the South African kind of uh, psychology of Ubuntu really melds well with with blockchain, um, Richie said it once as well, and you know, we have very we have a lot of similarities in thinking about uh, the collective rather than the individual. And the blo blockchain ecosystem really uh, purports this, and it's kind of one of its tenets, you know. So, I think that we picked it up very well. Um, I think Africa and South Africa really leapfrog the, the digital mobile banking era, and we still are kind of leaders in that space. And I think we're, we are leapfrogging um, right now into the Web3 space. So um, it's exciting. Um, there's tons of great companies locally and in Africa here, and they're doing amazing things. Um, and they've been doing it for a very long time. And one of, the, one of the biggest things is that we actually have had for a long time a lot of access or education into the space. Um, the universities and there's lots of academies and workshops and accelerators that, that really work to educate large amounts of people from all different uh, walks of life, whether they have access to tech or not, because they make it, make it available. And these are people like Blockchain Academy um, or the Bitcoin Academy and, and UCT and some other, there's some other really, really big players that have been making it available and, and really putting it up there as, as one of the, the next things in tech that we need to be focusing on. And, you know, the South African Reserve Bank has been playing around with making a, you know, a, a stable token for, I don't know, since like 2015 or even before that. So, you know, the government has been involved in cryptocurrency or in blockchain t 
tech for, for, for very long as well. And I can't really speak to other, other countries in Africa, but South Africa, at least where I am, is really stepping up. Well, you mentioned a couple ideas and people there that I want to inform listeners that haven't heard those things before. You referenced Richie Laburn. I've had Richie on the podcast before with Boyd Vardy. They're indexers at the graph. Their indexer operation is called Index Africa, and they're also members of Graphrica. But you also mentioned the concept of Ubuntu. And I'd love to invite you to define that term and kind of help listeners understand what you mean by what is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African philosophy that focuses around the community of the individual. It says, I am because of you. Um, in Africa, a community raises a child, not a family. And similarly, we believe that working together will get us further than going it alone. The philosophy has a great quote, which explains it quite well. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Kent, if we could go back in time then, when did you first become aware of crypto and what was it that interested you about it? Some of my university friends and colleagues at my first tech job uh, back uh, while I was studying were mining Litecoin and Bitcoin in their apartments in 2011. I was fascinated, but I didn't really have any capital to buy a rig or to, to invest. And frankly, I didn't really understand much about it and I didn't really look into it. I was quite young and naive, but I did use my laptop to mine some Bitcoins. And uh, when I saw that the price spiked in 2013, my ears pricked up and I realized that the laptop that I had mined on had gotten stolen um, and I didn't back up my, any of my keys. And this really taught me a lesson. Uh, so when 2016, my roommate and fellow coder said, hey, come look at this Ethereum Frontier site, I was absolutely blown away. And it's kind of been a love affair ever since. I mean, I'm quite obsessive and this is an obsession for me. But when I was kind of going through it and there was like Slocket and all of these crazy like implementations and use cases of it. It was like a sluice gate had opened in my mind. I was able to really look at our society and our, our economy and uh, see it for what it was. It, you know, it was fractured and broken and there were so many problems. There were so many people being taken advantage of and serious issues. And there was people who had access and people who didn't. And I saw that blockchain could fix it or at, at least alleviate some of the issues or alleviate some of the pain that we have. And, you know, a lot of people think about like, you know, DeFi and all these other things, but Slocket was initially nothing to do with DeFi or any of these sort of monetary systems. It was purely for like a utility. It was created to allow autonomy of a lot of the things that we use in life, like cars and, and houses and locks and electrical equipment inside of apartments. And they, and they really painted a beautiful dream. And the use cases outside of that were, were immense. Um, um, and yeah, it, it, that, that year for me was, was immense. I learned so much. I was obsessive. I was the guy in Cape Town that was telling everybody, go look at this thing, invest. It's cheap if you want to make money, but it's way bigger than that. Get involved. And I was irritating to a point, but a lot of those people come back to me now and were like, damn, I should have listened to you. But uh, say love you. So can I have to ask about this laptop that was stolen and the Bitcoin that you mined? How much did you have and, and how have you dealt with that loss? I mentioned it, that, yeah, we mined 24 Bitcoin on my laptop over a period of a few years. And um, I was naive and I just like, I kind of, I actually just forgot about it. And it was on a laptop that had a key and I knew that I had 24 and I came home one day and that laptop was taken. And I didn't, at that point, realized that it, there had been Bitcoin on it because I was like, eh, it was back of my mind. But when 2013 hit and the price went over $1,300, I was like, that is a lot of money. And I'd never experienced that, that sort of money or you know, been close to it my whole life. So it really, you know, regret is something very, very powerful. And um, it, it really made me prick my ears up. And you know, I've, you learn to roll with the punches, but you know, that sort of, that lost, I don't even think about like, it's, it's just something that happened and it's a good lesson. And, um, I had more lessons in the future. Another follow-up I want to ask you is about Slocket. I don't think I'm familiar with what you mean by that or, or that term. What is Slocket? So Slocket, uh, S L O C K dot I T, um, were one of the first big companies to, to kind of hit the scene in 2016. It was a lot of the guys from the Ethereum uh, Foundation, um, Stephen Tual and some other guys. Uh, and I think a large amount of the community that's still here today were involved in that project. I mean, if I go to the Medium blog for, for Slocket, there is 
literally every single big name in the industry that has that has different um, different endeavors or different projects now or similar ones. But anyway, Slocket was a company that started um, that wanted to basically uh, that did build smart locks connected to smart contracts. So you could essentially have a smart contract open up a lock of a apartment like an Airbnb. Um, and I think this was around the time that Airbnb kind of started. So you could have these autonomous houses where someone could scan a QR code and it would basically take enough funds for to run the electricity and the appliances and maybe some insurance money. And then it would close the locks um, or only give them access for a certain amount of time. And you could basically scale this out to the appliances in the house, um, the TV, you could scale it out to a car. And they, they, they were big. And the Slocket essentially became the DAO um, eventually. And the DAO, as you know, it was the big DAO hack in 2016, which forced us to fork. Um, I say us because I also eventually were, I was mining um, quite a lot of Ethereum at the time of the fork. So I had quite a large mining operation uh, set up. It wasn't massive, but it was, it was, it was quite big. Um, I did it with one of my friends. And yeah, Slocket, they, they were one of the big first companies in 2016. They were the first DAO or one of the first DAOs. There was also Digex back then. It was like gold-backed tokens. They also had a massive sale, massive DAO. And that was also before the hack. So or before, the, before the hack and before the fork. So yeah, that's Locket. You should go check it out. It's a great idea. It's a great utility. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, dApps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ. On June 2nd, I'll be in San Francisco, California for Graph Day. As most listeners already know, I have a non-technical background, and I think that's important to note. Graph Day isn't only for developers and builders, it's also for people like me, and maybe even you, who are interested in meeting more of the community, seeing where their background and experience can be useful, and participating in something that's so critical to the future of Web3. Plus, many of the former GRT IQ podcast guests will be there, so I guess I'm also anxious to see some friends. There's a link in the show notes if you're interested in learning more how you can come and participate at Graph Day. I hope to see you there. So, staying with this idea of you know how you got your start and everything, how then do you move as a into the industry and, and go to work in crypto and blockchain? So, as I said um, earlier, I really wanted to get involved in, in the industry in 2016 when I saw Frontier website. So I wanted to get involved and the meetup groups in Cape Town were almost dead or they, they, they just didn't have the support they needed. They needed locations um, and the, they needed people to kind of be advocates and to run around and basically set up these sort of uh, locations and to make sure there were snacks and to, and to basically put together a talk. And, um, in 2016, I was working at a building where the top floor was run by Barclays. It was called Barclays Rise, and it was an accelerator um, program in tech. They had um, really, Web3 became a big focus in the future. But um, And like two floors down, there was the Bitcoin Academy. So, you know, this was 2016, and there was a Bitcoin Academy on the third floor where I was working. And on the top floor, they had this really, really great space that had um, facilities for conferencing and events. And um, I made a point to reach out to the Ethereum meetup group in Cape Town and I offered, I spoke to the Barclays Rise floor, the people there, and I said, hey, I want to host this Ethereum event and would you guys have me? And they said, you know, we'd be happy to have you. We'd, we'll supply drinks and food for you and give you this big auditorium or this big space. And it was really, really great. And I met a lot of people there that, um, you know, are pioneers in the space still today and they are pioneers globally and locally. And you know, I gave a talk about mining and I gave a talk about the use cases that you could do. Um, I hadn't been developing at that point yet. I was just trying to understand the ecosystem better. I was gave a talk on what a blockchain is and what Ethereum is and how it's different from Bitcoin and spoke about mining and I spoke about some of the applications. 
And after that, I was working in, you know, my enterprise job doing like .NET full stack, but I really was obsessed and like every single day I was uh, on, on an exchange or on a website learning about something. I had Mist Explorer or the Mist wallet uh, installed on my laptop from like, you know, first, first iteration. I think I still have maybe the third version on my oldest MacBook and it still has some of those badges that you get that aren't NFTs, they're badges. So it's a little bit different. So yeah, it was, it, I became, I became totally obsessed with the, with the ecosystem and I left and I started working in, in the Web3 space full time for a company called Linum Labs as a tech lead and uh, essentially built out the development team and some of the processes and they gave me amazing opportunities and I learned so much there. So that was my first induction, uh, as I said, and the space moves so quickly and um, you have to be on it all the time. I thought that like, you know, Web2 tech moved quickly and, I, you know, I was around and was like playing around with React and was the brand new and it's like, this is the coolest thing ever. And nowadays people are like saying that React's old, you know? So um, for me, this was just like absolutely super bleeding edge. It was such a fast paced industry. So I was, I was hooked and they were using all the most, like they were using all the bleeding edge tech and for someone stuck in web two uh, in the .NET space, back then it was ASP.NET or it was MVC. And um, you had, you didn't really have a lot of options for like this really, really cool markdown languages. They, a lot of them were in Angular. So a lot of my reasons for moving over to the industry was also to be able to play with this awesome tech and to be on the bleeding edge. It's really important. And it's, it's, it's actually one of the best places to be. For listeners that don't know what is meant by mining, and I've had many guests of the podcast come on and say they were miners, that they had a mining operation. I've never actually asked the question of what is mining and what's the utility of it? Why do people do it? Would you mind describing, at least for you and, and your perspective, what mining is and what the utility of doing it is? So because blockchains are decentralized and we have multiple sources of truth, essentially, we don't have a single source of truth. We have multiple versions of the truth. This is because we are hosting the same data globally on many, many different nodes or computers or servers, right? In traditional web two, we kind of trust uh, Google, Facebook, whatever, to host it on their servers and they have control, they have autonomy. But you know, if you think about a bank's servers, if it's held in one place, it is quite susceptible to things like hacking and natural disasters and war and human corruption. So, you know, when you have many, many different sources of truth and you have many of these servers that are holding the full truth, how do you make sure that everyone is playing a part and being, being truthful, right? So you have to come to consensus. So what that means is you have, if you have 100 people, and 99 of them say that this apple is green and one person says, no, it's red, then you know that you have consensus that the apple is green because that one person is probably lying, right? And this is the work that miners do. Miners basically do a bit of work and the work is computational work. They're running a, a computation and basically what this computation is doing is checking that the new block produced has the right information in it, which refers to the previous blocks, which refer to the previous blocks. Refer. There's some other computations that it does, but it basically checks that someone hasn't like basically put up, pushed up a fake block. They also check the rest of everybody else's confirmations and they produce a block from work. They get paid for this, right? So they are the ones that are supporting the network, the miners. And this is only in proof of work, in a proof of work uh, consensus model. Uh, we have proof of stake. Right, which is slightly different, but yeah. So essentially, what mining is is you basically for Ethereum um, is quite different from Bitcoin. But for Ethereum, what it means in practical terms is you're getting a bunch of very expensive uh, graphics cards, GPU units, and you're lining them up as many as you can on one machine, and you're running a bit of software. And what that software is doing is basically syncing with the blockchain. It's taking that information that uh, that the new work that is being posted. And it is basically listening for, for new transactions on the network in the mempool. It's grabbing those, it wants to process those into a block. And we don't have to go into the technical bits of it, but yeah. That's a great explanation. So are miners the ones that get paid in this Ethereum context, the gas fees? They do. And they also get like a block reward. So 
when you produce a new block, you get a block reward, and um, this is a a set amount that that changes at a certain point in time. Over time, it goes, it keeps halving. Yeah, they also get the gas fees. I have to imagine there's a listener to this podcast that's thinking, well, maybe I can get into mining. I understand the operations that Kent just described there. I've got the know-how, the wherewithal to to build something like that. What are some of the reasons people should be cautious about jumping into mining? So mining is hardware intensive. It is also time intensive. Once you set it up, and if you set it up really well, you will inevitably run into consistent issues with packages. You have to consistently update your, your software. It's very expensive to get into, and it's extremely competitive. If you want to make a good amount of money in mining, you have to put a lot of money into it. And if you're in a place where electricity is expensive, then it also doesn't become viable. If you're in a place that has high heat in summer or high heat during most of the year, it's also not viable because the machines get extremely hot and will burn out. There are many reasons why people should not mine. I have one big one. It is not worth your time. There are a lot of people doing it, but if you really are invested in it, it's who you are, definitely do it, right? Go and do it. If you really, really believe that this is what you want to do, but uh, you're going you're gonna to spend a lot of money and you're going to come out with a little bit of money. I want to turn our attention to, to Africa and Grafrica and the work you're doing there. But before we do, as I hear you tell your story, your background, how you got involved, all these different things that follow along your personal narrative, I'm seeing this person come alive with passion and interest in Web3, in blockchain. And you've mentioned a couple of reasons why that might be the case. You've talked a little bit about economics. You've talked a little bit about leading edge technology. But as you reflect on all of this, how would you explain why it is that you became a man on fire about blockchain and Web3? Um, I think that once I realized what Web3 could do and um, what it meant for the world, it became quite clear that this was a really disruptive industry. And people use that word quite a lot, disruptive industries. And this was really a disruptive industry. And it was the first one that could really take on the banks. And it's the first one that could take on, you know, socioeconomic structures that we've had in place for hundreds of years. And um, I think that Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations looks a lot more like what we have in the blockchain than our current economy. We have a lot more of a democratized opt-in sovereignty with Web3. You know, you, you can choose to participate. And when you participate, it is very democratic. You have so full sovereignty of your wallet if you're using the full Web3 experience. No one can come take it away from you unless they come to your house and really get it from you. And um, I think it really started giving, it started giving power back and breaking down the barriers to entry for a lot of people, especially in places where their own governments couldn't provide them the, the access that they needed. So once they had access to Web3 and this, these kind of borderless transactions, borderless communities. And I mean, that is one of the biggest things that really excites me is the communities that have come up out of Web3. I mean, the thing that I get most excited about is what we don't know yet and what we can't imagine. Because when I started working in this ecosystem, DeFi wasn't even defined yet. And, you know, NFTs as art were around, but they weren't really big. And we were really thinking as an ecosystem on utility for NFTs and how to bring utility into NFTs rather than, you know, NFTs as art. And there is so much out there. And it's actually great to go into ecosystems and like, you know, different communities, different discords, different Twitter spaces, and go and speak to people about actually what's happening and also listen. And what I've found is that, you know, even in these NFT communities, they speak about community they and how they were brought together and how this being part of this, like, you know, just buying into this NFT has brought them closer to people that they would have never have known. And they were able to kind of form these communities and act on the community. And like, it, you know, I've said this before in other chats with, with some of my friends, um, I've said that NFTs are catalysts for, for DAOs. You know, they, they are a way for people to align on certain values and then work together with capital and time and effort to a common good. And I could have never seen that that happen. Um, and 
it's kind of a no-brainer, but when you go and speak to people about it, when, when, you, when you listen to them and you actually just make them aware of what they said, they are actually blown away at the power of it. And I see it every single day and I'm just excited for the next things and to be part of building the next, the next big thing. Well, let's talk about the next big thing in the context of Africa. And I already asked you a question about South Africa, but if we zoom out a little bit and we just look at the continent and we look at all the activity, all the enthusiasm there for blockchain and Web3, you've started Grafrica, you're very plugged into the community there. How would you explain to listeners that may not be up to speed on everything that's happening in Africa in the context of Web3 and blockchain? So Africa is hungry. Africa has a lot of talent. I am consistently meeting men and women, actually more women than men, <laughs> throughout Africa who are joining my community. They're also reaching out to me in different channels, and I'm actively going to their communities. Just the other day, I had a discussion with a group of developers called Ngeni Devs from East Africa, and they're all around from Kenya and Uganda and those areas. And they have a group of up to 50 devs, which they train and work on, on different Web3 projects together. They're absolutely amazing. and I'm hoping that I can help them more in their community with, with Grafrica. And what Grafrica is, is the home of the Graph Network in Africa. And essentially, we're a community of, of talent, of like-minded thinkers. Uh, you don't have to be from Africa to join. We want to connect Africa and connect the talent and like-mindedness to show you that we are leaders and we, are, we have the talent and we have the drive to kind of lead Africa and the world in, in this next iteration. And we host community calls. We host free training sessions in Web3 for anybody who wants to take the plunge. And Africa is really blowing up. It always has been. I mean, I'm always blown away at the new projects coming out. And it's a, it's a lot around utility. Um, most of these projects are around utility. And just to speak about some of the companies, we have Invest Capital, which are some huge players here. We have Linum Labs, amazing development company, very close to my heart. And we also have like Invictus Capital. Uh, they started off as Crypto20. They also in the DeFi ecosystem. Just recently in Cape Town, we had the Luno Tower go up. Luno is a local exchange. We had this big building with the lights shining all day and all night with Luno. And now it's like it's the tallest building in the city and it's shining with cryptocurrency. You know, it's a big exchange, which is absolutely surreal. Within Grafrica, we have huge delegations from Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya. And it's growing every single day. We endeavor more people from North Africa and all over to come and join us. We're doing cool stuff. We also have the ability to train and place you eventually. We have a lot of cool development partners that we're busy working with. And there is endless work in the Web3 space for everyone. And when I mean everyone, it is marketers, it is lawyers, it is builders, farmers, anybody who worked in any industry that can think about how they can apply blockchain to the industry is welcome. And that's what it's about, right? We disrupt and we change. Blockchain is not just tech. It can be applied to every single facet of life. And Africa needs this. Africa knows this. I mean, M-Pesa is digital money. It's been around since two, 2007. Absolute leaders. And for, for Africa, we already understand how to use this digital money. We've had cell phone banking forever. Most people live off mobile banking in Africa, which is a huge problem. We call it the unbanked, and um, it's, it's one of the biggest issues we have to solve. And I think also in the African context, we're much more aware of these issues and all of you know, the, the third world issues. So they come front and center. We should be looking at these problems in our society, and Africa does. They look at what we can do to fix, how we can, how we can bootstrap funding into into local business, how we can revolutionize a local business or a local industry with blockchain. And I'm just waiting to see what, what is next to come from Africa. So you mentioned anyone can get involved with Grafrica. What's the best way for a listener who has interest to do that? So anybody can join the Grafrica community. We're on Discord. You can go to grafrica.org. There is a big join us button there that'll direct you to our Discord. Um, it's free and open to anybody who wants to come and learn more and be part of our community. And some exciting news, Grafica is also becoming a development service provider. We have a few developers working with us, and we are actively training developers to come and move up into our ranks. Uh, we work with some great companies, and we build subgraphs, all sort of Web3 fun. And um, 
we'd love for, for more people to come and join our community because we are looking for developers. Hi, this is Ken Free with Graphica. If my conversation with TRTIQ podcast has been helpful to you, then please consider supporting future episodes by becoming a subscriber. Visit trtiq.com slash podcast for more information. That's trtiq.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. Well, I definitely want to encourage listeners that are interested in getting involved with Graphica and learning more about everything that's happening in Africa to take you up on that and join the Discord. And you've already mentioned a couple times that you have worked in and have some passion for what the Graph is doing. When did you first become aware of the Graph? So at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, I was doing a lot of architecture for a few different companies, and these were quite large ecosystems. They were most of the time, either one or two dApps per ecosystem. So it was quite a lot of front-end work and wiring up to do. There was many contracts, uh, sometimes up to 14, and multiple backends to basically do coordination for these contracts, whether it was store of chain data, index the contracts to serve them as you know the state of the contracts up to the front-end. And um, yeah, having built a backend that indexes um, smart contracts in the state that the smart contracts are in and the events before from scratch, it requires so much work. Um, it requires that you obviously build it. This is probably the easier part because you can spin up a backend that has a database. Um, there's lots of boilerplate code for that. You use something like Web3 or Ethers to, to listen for the events that you want to listen for, and then you create the entities in, inside the callbacks. Um, the problem with this is that you're essentially listening to every single event which is okay, but it kind of sucks for certain contracts if you're listening to events on an ELC20 token that's being used quite a lot by a lot of people, then you kind of are only listening for the ones that you're doing. This doesn't happen very often, but what I'm saying is having built a large backend to index smart contracts in the past, I knew what went into it and building it is the easy part. Actually running it and maintaining it is the hard part. The DevOps required and... Um, the version control of packages. And if something goes wrong, it just stops and you have to re-index from scratch again or, or, or from a certain block. This could take up to a couple of months. And when I found the graph while looking for solutions, I was immediately interested. And I think I took the current project that I was working on. I threw about three or four contracts at the CLI, spun something up in one night. And I was like, woof. There's our state API, there's our indexer, you know, and this was back when they didn't have the, the decentralized network yet. It was only hosted service. So I was having a lot of fun and um, I was really enjoying it. The, the hardest part was convincing my clients that they should be going that route. I hope that they're still happy with the choice that we made for them. And I hope that it's paid off because I think it's probably the best thing you could have done. Yeah, that was the first time I became aware of the graph. What's a CLI? Command line interface. So the Graph CLI is a, is a package, one of many of the packages that the Graph um, has. And the Graph command line interface allows you to basically spin up the project uh, from a couple of commands or is essentially prompts you for what the contract address is, where the ABI is, what network it's on, uh, what you want to call the subgraph. And it, it essentially, it spins up and it builds, it scaffolds. It scaffolds out a new project for you that has the basics that you need to start your subgraph, but you need a lot of work to go from there. Longtime listeners of the podcast will know that it's happened multiple times where a guest has said they found the graph because they were working on something. They needed a solution for it. They found the graph, it plugged in, and it made their life easier, or it checked an important box on what they were trying to accomplish. You went through this a little bit there when you talked about how you first became aware of the graph, but diving a little deeper, how does the graph make life easier for people like you that are working on the projects that you described earlier? Well, the first way it makes it way easier is that we're able to build APIs for our smart contracts very, very quickly. This requires a lot of custom work if you're doing it by hand. Um, it requires a lot of skills, which a new developer doesn't have. When a new developer comes to a graph, and you ask me from my perspective, right? So how it solves problems for us as developers in the ecosystem is it makes something very complex quite quite simple. That is the hosting part of it. People don't have to host their own subgraphs. They 
they can if they want to. You can run your own node and you can host your own subgraph, right? But the hosted network and the decentralized network basically allow developers to iterate way faster. They allow them to create these APIs extremely quickly. I mean, the other day I did a two hour session and we created the, the beginnings of the LuxRay um, subgraph, right? It's not completed, but in a two hour session, I was able to take absolute newbies through the rungs of how to do it. And it doesn't take that long. Um, what it means for the ecosystem is, is another thing. Uh, the possibilities, the applications, haven't even, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. And I had a lot of great ideas halfway through last year, which I'm only seeing come to fruition now. And um, I'm happy to see that some people have, have come to the same conclusions as me on, on, on how to use it. I want to one-up them. But I'm also very, very excited about some of the new things coming out, like data edges. That pattern is something that I've been needing for a few of my applications for quite a while. And um, you know, cross-chain bridges, uh, using subgraphs as an L2 layer. I've been playing around with ideas for like eight months about that. Um, so I am extremely excited about what it can do, how you can leverage it. I'm still learning new ways to use it um, and fun, fun ways. If you're creative, you can do amazing things with the subgraph. It, it can turn some work that would usually take you a month into a very, very pleasant two days of work. And you feel like you accomplished something amazing because you did. You, you've basically indexed the smart contract. And it simplifies. It simplifies the process. It's an amazing tool. And the ecosystem around it, and, and this is just from a developer's perspective. I'm talking from a developer's perspective, using it as a tool to create subgraphs, right? Which are these APIs for, for, for decentralized applications, right? Th there's a whole other side. There's a whole economy about curators and indexes and delegators. And I see it as donut-shaped economies. And, you know, they... They all pay back onto each other. If if we have people participating, right? All the protocols, all the EVMs, the graph is going to support them. That helps the graph. If we have indexes playing well, and we have curators playing well, and we have people querying these subgraphs, then the economy thrives. But there's there's a lot still to be built. We're in the early stages. Um, if anybody knows about the roadmap, the R and D roadmap, and and the other things coming, it's it's quite long and quite detailed and they're working on amazing things. So definitely jump into community calls uh, because they give you a little bit of a, a window into what's happening at the graph. You mentioned a lot of different things there, good ideas or initiatives that you've been keeping an eye on. One that I'm not 100% sure I understand fully yet is this idea of L2s and subgraphs becoming L2. How can you help me as a non-technical person understand what that is or how it works and, and why it's actually important? Hmm. I'll just say, go look at Hop Exchange. If, if people want to learn more, join Graphica and I can possibly teach you about it. Fair enough. So listeners will reach out to you, get a little more information there, but zooming out maybe just a little bit more, what's one idea or a couple use cases that most excites you? To go back to data edges, um, and I won't go too deep into this because you can go onto the forum and read about it, but essentially I started thinking about the limitations of of subgraphs, right? Because when you've built your subgraph and now you've got free time to, to play with it and um, you're not breaking your back trying to finish this large you know, backend or something, you, now you have time to play and to try and see what the limitations are of Solidity and you start doing some Googling. So I had the idea that you know, storing state to the blockchain is expensive because you have to spend gas, right? So I was thinking, well, what if we don't change any state, we just emit an event? And what is the theoretical limit of a string parameter? What is the limit of a string parameter for solidity function? And that made me think. I was just like, okay, well, if I have a subgraph with a function and I put some permissions there, like only owner, and I have a version of this on my GitHub if anybody wants to look. It's quite a lot of fun. It's called newer post. And essentially, I just thought, okay, well, we have a smart contract with a function that takes in some data of a string, just a, some string data, and it emits it a, as an event. So what, is the, what, what are the limitations of that string parameter? And I Googled it. And there was a few answers. And there were, the one answer said uh, it was you know, something reasonably small. And there was another answer and quite a few other answers that basically said that it was 
It's a large number. It's, um, it's a library's worth of books in text, or at least lots and lots and lots of books in text. You can post the whole book if you like, easily. Um, you can post m- multiple books in a, if you format it, basically what I'm saying is if you copy a whole book into your clipboard and you paste it into a HackMD file or a Markdown file, right? Google Doc, right? You take a whole book, you post it there. And when you push save, it's saving it to this function. It's not posting it to IPFS. It's not putting it there. It's just pushing it right through to the event. So I experimented and I did this with a, with a few books. It worked. And I was very, very cheap gas cost. And essentially, I was like, okay, well, you could essentially make your own blog this way. You could make a forum this way. You could add permission gating. Um, and the, the larger idea that I had was, you know, we could work towards putting the world's knowledge on a centralized decentralized because it's decentralized, but it's in one place on the blockchain. Uh, we could put all, all this knowledge, all this knowledge that we have, which is fractured and, you know, books are being burnt currently in, in parts of the world. So it's quite sad. But, you know, I, I look back to the Library of Alexandria and there's a beautiful story about the Library of Alexandria. You know, it was started by Alexander the Great and um, he wanted to create basically the, the the largest university, the world's knowledge, essentially. And it became that. It became the most prestigious university in the known world at the time. And there was women who, who, who were professors and supported like Hypatia. But the most important thing was that every single boat that came into port, they forced the boat to give over every book so that they could transcribe it to the library, every single record. They forced them and they would give it back. They pay people to go on book bounties, to go out into the world, to go find books and texts, to bring back to the Library of Alexandria. They employed tons of translators to rewrite it into different languages and, and different alphabets. Uh, and it was a university, so they were consistently adding to this knowledge. It was, it was amazing. And we know, obviously, it went down and got sad. And when I read about this, it gave me the idea that we could possibly have a similar sort of global library and we could have a decentralized network of bounties for people to go and find new texts or to, to go and find those texts and put them on to translate texts. Imagine what this could do for, for a new economy of translators that could translate books. Um, I know that Nestle and Cadbury had like a big campaign to, to translate X amount of books into African languages. and. You know, this is exactly the same sort of thing. What I like about it is that we could also add, you know, the governance of the world to this. You know, uh, we have Wikipedia, similar sort of thing. We could port that over. But the governance aspect of the world knowledge database is, is, is quite something remarkable because, you know, we, we won't have problems with people wiping things from history like they used to because of the immutability of the blockchain. So, yeah, that's one idea I had. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's, I haven't been working on it. But I really would like to see more, um, more attempts to to push data to the blockchain. And uh, there's some great ways you can do it, right? And there's great implementations for it. But yeah, I had a dream for to to rebuild the the library of Alexandria on the blockchain, and um, it might it might come true. I love the idea, and I appreciate you walking us through it. You're obviously somebody with a lot of ideas, and somebody who's really committed to the graph community. It should be noted that you're also a graph grant recipient. You were recently awarded a, a grant in Wave Five. What can you share about your experiences being a grant recipient? I'm firstly extremely honored to be on this wave. To tell you a little bit about how it came about, I had been in contact with a few people from the foundation and Edge and Node, Simon, and recently Carl Rojas as well. And I had been. This, this was midway through last year and closer to the end of last year, I was in contact with them. And this was first for Graphica because I was working on building up this community. It was actually Edge and Node and the Graph that put me in touch with Richie initially. So um, I really wanted to become part of the community. And I said, you know, what can I do to help? And um, the foundation in Edge and Node, they said, you know, we have a lot of these companies that they need help with uh, subgraphs. They need help with you know, getting EVM compatibility or getting the right tools up like multi-sig wallets to run an EVM compatible chain. Um, so they were putting me in touch with some of these companies and I ramped it up at the beginning of this year. Uh, I had always been involved in the, in the graph discord, um, 
mostly inside the subgraph support. But at the beginning of this year, I ramped it up and I was asked to help out with matchstick testing. So to work with the Lime Chain team to basically help test the new versions of matchstick and some of the other um, features that they're going to release and provide support and some some inputs on on them in meetings. So I started doing that earlier this year, uh, as well as really ramping up my my involvement in the community. I was running Graphic at that time and I had a lot of time sitting on a Discord. So, you know, my my Discord would always ping and I would help out in the community. People had an issue. And I got to meet Slim Chance and I got to meet like Payne and a lot of the other advocates that you know today. And I was in contact with them because they would help me and they would point me in the right direction. And I would also flag some issues that I would find in code to them. And yeah, that's that's essentially where where the relationship started. Um, and then the foundation reached out to me and offered me a grant for the work that I'd been putting in. Um, so I, I, was, I honestly wasn't expecting it. And I was just happy to help out in the community at the time. I was really enjoying it. I was really in, I had always enjoyed the graph community. Um, I had done a little bit of soul searching at the end of last year um, to find out what I really wanted to do. And um, Graphica was what I wanted to do. So at the beginning of the year, I started ramping up my involvement. And you know, my hard work was seen. And what my grant entails is essentially that it's community support in, in technical manners. Um, so that's like subgraph support in other places. I support the Lime Chain team with some of the match tech testing. And I also will sit on some of the other calls to to kind of speak about community, to to look at some of the new the new clients and some of the new plugins that they're working on and give my advice and help out with the testing there too. Yeah, I'm really excited to be a grant recipient. I'm loving the work and I'm looking forward to continuing my support. How important do you think the graph is for the future of crypto and Web3? I think the graph is already extremely important. Um, I think the graph is, if you're not using it, you're really putting yourself at a disservice as a developer. I mean, not everybody has access to the graph tools, unfortunately. But I know that the, the graph team is trying to add more chains all the time. So why I think it's important is it really is a great starting point for new developers. For, for, for someone who isn't a developer at all, or so, someone who's self-taught with a little bit of JavaScript knowledge or, or whatever, um, for them to jump into like you know other environments and um, other stacks is quite, it's quite daunting. So... What I've found is that subgraphs actually, there, there's a nice balance there, right? So if you go and learn Solidity, and you have to have a little bit of Solidity knowledge to do a subgraph, but it's doable, right? There are resources out there to do that. From there, you have to know a little bit of data structures for your GraphQL, and you have to know a little bit of TypeScript. But those are totally manageable to learn if someone's helping you, or if you, if you have the time and you have the drive, it's easy to learn. Once you learn how to make a subgraph, you have TypeScript and GraphQL. Once you've built on those skills, you have TypeScript, GraphQL, and Solidity. And if you add React to that stack, you're a full stack Web3 developer, right? So you can build dApps. Well, how's that for a leapfrog? And in traditional Web2, you have to learn all these different disciplines. You have to learn them quite deeply. With regards to Web3, you're going into Solidity, and there's a lot of other things. But with a subgraph, Solidity, you don't have to know how to write it. But if you can read it and you understand the events and you understand what it's doing, then you can move, move from that and create subgraphs. Why the graph is really important for the ecosystem, you know, they stand on the middle ground. They stand as a, I kind of see them as the, the, the center post of the tent of Web3, you know, for the ecosystem that I work in, which is EVM compatibility and a little bit more. The graph just, for most of the solutions, it's part of the solution um, for, for a lot of the dApps and applications. That you see out there. And I'm just speaking about the development side, right? So I'm not even speaking about indexing. I'm not even speaking about curation or delegation right now. So I'm speaking from the, the developer's standpoint. I would love to be able to touch more on indexing and delegating and curating, but I'm not the expert on it. I've done a little bit of curating. I've done a little bit of delegating, but I deploy subgraphs and um, it makes my life as a Web3 developer way easier. And just because you have to build a subgraph for a smart contract doesn't mean it doesn't have to, it, it, it can't apply to a very web two sort of, or like a very real world thing. We can get really creative with what we do. And I've kind of explained that with like building a forum. Um, but subgraph development is 
it really gives you a lot of time to to work on being creative, which you would normally put into struggling to get your your back end deployed. So it's an amazing set of tools. It's an amazing protocol, which really is creating quite a vast economy. I'd like to see it grow. I'd like to see more indexes and more delegators and more curators and more people using the decentralized network. Do you think Web3 is an inevitability or is it an experiment we're kind of watching to see what happens next? I think that the standpoint is quite binary. As with life, everything's quite fluid and chaotic. And I mean, if we're going to say that Web3 and the blockchain ecosystem isn't chaotic and fluid, then we'd be doing ourselves a disservice. So I believe that Web3 will evolve. It will consistently evolve. There might be a Web4. We don't know. The really, really exciting thing is that it constantly changes so quickly. One thing I do think is that we do need to find balance. There's a lot of chaoticness inside of Web3. And as in nature, there's like balance and chaos. I think that we're, we, we always have to keep our minds that we have to find balance in, in what blockchain serves, right? And what I mean by this is there's a lot of things that we need to fix in the world and it doesn't have to do with money. So after you became aware of the graph, you've developed some passion for it. You're highly involved in the project. You know a lot of people within the community. What drives that level of passion? So I believe that the graph stands at a middle point in a very contentious and competitive industry. It supports everybody. It supports all protocols and chains, or at least it tries to. Their positioning as a supporting player is underestimated. They support all these different protocols and all these different chains, which are normally competitors in the space. They kind of stand as a middle ground for a lot of these competitors. And it's in their best interest for all of these companies, all of these protocols, all of these chains, all these dApps to succeed because that makes the graph succeed. So I think they're instrumental in the success of Web3 in the future. Um, and they are already instrumental in supporting Web3. I'd like to see more people understand this. And, you know, we're still on the frontier and we have, have this sort of momentum. That is one point of, about why I'm passionate. Another point is they have a large respect for the community and the people supporting them. They deliver on the promises that they make. And that's quite rare in the space. The whole ecosystem around the graph runs very professionally, all the companies. But the community, the community that the graph has created is, is something that I've never seen before. And I'm very happy to be part of it. So I'm really looking forward to the future. Well, Kent, thank you so much for answering that and so many other questions here. I now want to turn our attention to the GRTIQ 10 questions that I ask every guest of the podcast so that listeners can learn something new, try something different or achieve more. So are you ready, Kent, for the GRT IQ 10? Yeah. The GRT IQ 10. This is the one. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. Kent, what's one book or article that's had the most impact on your life? So The Alchemist by Paulo Coulomb. I hope I didn't butcher that. That book changed my life when I read it at 13. Um, It taught me about being conscious of yourself in the world and other people and self-actualization. So everybody should read it if you haven't. It's an easy read and it's an amazing read. Is there a movie or a TV show that you think every human should be required to watch? I'm a big Trekkie and I love Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. I think that it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, image of the future. Um, and what we can do if we work together. The quotes in there are just, they're eternal. Kent, if you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, what one would you choose? This is an impossible question because, yeah, it literally is impossible, but it would probably be Grace Lambert, Paul Simon. Um, It's probably one of the most deeply South African albums there is, and it features Ladysmith Black Mombazo, which is an African choir, And if you haven't heard it, it is heart-wrenching and will bring tears to your eyes. What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? My CEO and uh, mentor at one of the past companies that I worked said that therapy is just as important as physical and mental exercise. He said that, you know, you need to spend 10% of your salary, go once a week, like you would go exercise a couple of times a week and you would do a Sudoku for a challenge. Um, Therapy is incredible incredibly important and took me a while to take his take his advice but yeah it's changed my life 
What's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most people know? Think twice about your future and look long and hard and far into your future before you act. Regret is debilitating and it lasts forever. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? Uh, to make time for yourself in the morning. Uh, I'm a morning person and I think that everyone should try and wake up early if they can. It just get to start on your day. And what I try and do first thing in the morning is, is meditate. Uh, waking up early and having some time for myself and starting my day with the right intentions. Essentially the idea that an idle mind is the devil's playground. So creating the right intentions first thing in the morning really does help. Kent, based on your own experiences and observations in the world, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains people finding success in life? Consistency. Um, and that has to do with remembering as well, having a good memory. So being consistent and remembering to be consistent is, is very important. Another thing is to, to try and learn from other people's mistakes. And that goes with having a good memory. So if you're consistent and you continue doing the same thing and doing it better than you did before, you will be successful. And then the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. So Kent, complete this sentence. The thing that most excites me about Web3 is... What we can't imagine yet. How about this one? If you're on Twitter, then you should be following... Crypto Obi-Wan and 6529 and Grafrica. And then lastly, complete the sentence. I'm happiest when... I'm in nature. The GRT IQ 10. After this, I show you how deep the rabbit is. Kent Forey, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate how gracious you've been and a lot of great answers here and insights you've shared. If people want to learn more about you or the work you're doing, especially with Grafrica, what's the best way to do it? So you can get us on grafrica.org. Uh, there's a big join us button there to join our Discord. That's where we are. You can reach me at KTFOU on Twitter. Uh, that's KTFOU. You can get all the links to Grafrica and also my Discord handle, which is Mac. So if you'll find it all on my Twitter. I um, hope to see you in Grafrica and the Graph Protocols Discords. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-T-I-Q podcast.